there, Mr. and Mrs. John Key Public, and welcome to another edition of the South Austin Show, Woo! where, where we, uh, we're going to uh, showcase culture, music, food, art, you name it, uh, uh, all features of South Austin. And, and we're concentrating on South Austin, I, I think, because it is where the soul of Austin does reside. Now, you can name the most important swimming hole in town, I bet, Barton Springs. And where is it? South Austin. Austin. And now, it's, fa it's in... It's in uh, the most important park in Austin, and where is that? Zilker Park, South Austin. Yeah. And, 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 what, and what is Barton Springs fed by? It's fed by the most important creek in Austin, Barton Creek, and where is that? South Austin. Yeah. So uh, now we've established uh, where we'll be uh, during the show. Uh, I'd, oh, like to, I'd like to segue to, uh, to also one of the other cultural pools of South Austin. We have with us tonight uh, Michael Priest, who is uh, uh, famed in lore and legend and has been in Austin since, since when, Michael? 1969. 1969. Made the big move south of the river in 1973. Uh, and, and, and I'd been employed there for a while at that point. So uh, you were there when uh, the armadillo was in its flower, I guess. Yes, I suppose you could say that. Went down there. Well, my very first trip there, when my son was only nine weeks old, to see Captain Beefheart in the magic band, the real magic band, ladies and gentlemen. And I took my nine-week-old son with me. And uh, it was pretty great. It reminded me of some of my favorite underground places I'd been to in Dallas and other places in that the front was completely nondescript, closed-down warehouse. And you drove around the back, and there was a bunch of stuff piled everywhere and some broken cars and some tore-down fence and you went in what looked like an abandoned building, and here was all these hippies. And in those days, there was rooms all the way around the hall that housed different things, like the organic bakery, uh -huh. and uh, the stage was up on the opposite end of the where we all got used to it being. Well, the, what, the Dilla was one of the first places in town with a daycare center. Well, that's true. Uh, uh, we always encourage folks to bring the whole family, and many folks had kids while they were there. At one point, we had 11 or 12. I wish Emma was here. Emma was in charge of the kids. Oh. And she can tell you some hair-raising stories. And it'd be really double fun to bring the kids, who are all in their late 20s now. <laughs> they can vote. Yes, they can vote. They're damn near able to be elected president. Oh, my goodness. So how did you get tied in with the, uh, the whole poster manufacturing scene uh, that the armadillo really kicked off? Well, I was real interested in it from the first time I saw one of Jim Franklin's rag covers at the uh, Louisville Pop Festival in 1969. I just got out of high school. In fact, we got out of high school, we jumped straight in the car and drove all the way to Atlanta for the first international pop festival, featuring 20 or 30 of the biggest bands in the world. Grand all Funk on the Railroad same made stage. Them. Well, now, they were a band that was manufactured by the record company and included on that bill. In Atlanta? To, to <laughs> see, as a marketing uh, uh, project. And uh, it worked so well <laughs> that as we were leaving there, we found out about Woodstock, but we couldn't figure out a way to blow six weeks on the East Coast so that we could be at Woodstock. And then James stole some cookies out of the 7-Eleven, and we had to leave the state in a pretty big hurry. There you go. And uh, uh, when I came down to Austin, I went right to the drag, right to the rag office, which was in the basement of the uh, University Y building on 24th and Guadalupe, which the first floor had collapsed into. And so <laughs> 22nd and Guadalupe, wh where the Scientology building is now. 22nd, you're 22nd, right. 22nd, right across yes. from... Not 24th. Right across from campus. 24th. Anyway, they had old window wells, which is how you got light into basements in the old days. And uh, the way you got in was you walked between, between the bushes of the shrubbery uh, lying across the base of the building and down into the window well and into the window of the rag office, another truly underground. You know, there's a lot of kids these days think they invented underground. Well, it goes back a ways. And a lot of Austin's original underground institutions were, in fact, underground, including underground. the RAG. The Armadillo had, yeah, was pretty underground. Well, that, that, the, uh, the secret beer vault. Well, yes, it was. <laughs> and for those of you that don't know, the Armadillo had been the uh, uh, National Guard armory. 
and the magazine where they kept all the explosives and ammunition, a large concrete bunker underground, became the beer vault at the Armadillo. Ah. And it was particularly good. We were just remembering Doug Somm's stories this last week ah. during the course of celebrating his life. And uh, one of my favorite ones was the giant flood at Armadillo happened the day of a Doug Somm show when Doug was a touring act from San Francisco featuring Martin Fierro and several members of uh, Tracy Nelson's old band Mother Earth. Mother Earth. And uh, my brother, my little brother was about 18 then. He had just started working at Armadillo sweeping up. He got to work and uh, the whole joint was flooded. The brand new beer garden we just finished was completely underwater. All the railroad ties that the, it was made out of were floating. Uh, the water had come up over the slab and into the hall such that the entire hall, 10,000 square feet or so, was under two or three inches of water with fine silt. They are. And the uh, magazine down underneath where the beer was was completely full of water and so was the newly instituted game room which had just been carpeted the night before. Ouch. All completely up to the ceiling in water and needless to say that beer wasn't getting any colder in that flood water. Yeah. And so uh, all kinds of stuff had to happen all of a sudden. The uh, uh, Lone Star people provided us with pumps and with replacement refrigeration units to try and get the water out of there and get the temperature down on that beer. And the Air Force out here at Bergstrom provided us with several thousand pounds of dry ice to keep the beer cold until the refrigeration units could be replaced, which had burned themselves up. Which their, their mission was readiness, and they did a fine job that day. We had this convoy came rolling into Armadillo, big trucks full of dry ice with Jeep outriders. It was way cool. Sirens. It was very, very nice. And got got ready for the time for Doug's show. Well, we were there. We got the beer where it wasn't gonna. We weren't gonna lose the 120 something kegs that were down there. Then, of course, once we got the water out, and it all was caused by a four-inch drain being blocked by a single baggie. So y'all dispose of those baggies correctly, will you please? You mean there were baggies we in the Armadillo World Headquarters? This this <laughs> entire problem could have been averted. But the best visual aspect of the whole day was once the water had subsided from the hall, the floor, which was pretty damn slick anyway, ah. because of the whenever it was humid, uh, has now covered with about a sixteenth of an inch of fine clay wet clay and it was slicker than Al shit uh -huh. and uh, you may That's remember slick. the many large pieces of cast off carpet which were the, about the only thing there was to sit on most of the time and uh, they were pretty malodorous most of the time their own cells well they were underneath this and in order to squeeze out all the clay we had to first pick up the wet carpet which was suction to the floor now uh -huh. and really wet and really heavy having been completely soaked so here was 12 to 24 large burly individuals in uh, whatever non-slip shoes they could find and as little else as possible because they were trying to roll up these pieces of carpet and then put a four wheel just a piece of four by eight plywood with four uh, caster wheels on it underneath the middle of it and then try and flop the two ends over onto it and push it away. And of course, it wanted to flop back. And it would, when it would, it would just send guys twirling on their bellies and on their backs in every direction. And it was like wrestling giant cold enchiladas on a real, real greasy pan. Took forever. Finally got all of the uh, carpet up out of there. It was just astounding, the effort that had to be exerted. Got it all squeezed out mopped several times and there were still a few puddles when Doug who luckily was late coming in from San Francisco late for sound check and uh, we the show started at nine o'clock which is when all the other armadillo shows started ah but after the uh, carpet problem I went home to get some sleep because I'd been up since eight that morning which I didn't usually do and when I came back Dale says 
come with me, I want you to see something amazing. And we walked down to the coal vault and the door of the coal vault, which is the old powder magazine, is slightly open and the uh, smoke from the dry ice is pouring out that door. And we open it up and inside is tall, skinny Lloyd Gehring in full Arctic, uh, what do you call those? Anorak Parkas. parka with hood and everything, a full set of skin diving tanks with regulator <laughs> and face mask and breather and big insulated rubber electrician's gloves. And he's changing the lines on the kegs, going from empty kegs to full kegs to keep the service going upstairs. And uh, absurd as this looks and is, as we're going out, Dale says, but you ought to you need to find out how we came to that. And I said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, we were so pleased that the, we got the dry ice in there and it dropped the temperature. We weren't going to lose the beer that we started selling beer out in the beer garden, which all that beer came from down here, too. Right. And uh, Mike Hare wasn't thinking anything about it. He was selling beer and kegs started to run dry. So he ran downstairs. Fortunately, he didn't close the coal vault door good behind him, so it was still standing a little open, went in. The room had been full of dry ice for over an hour. There was no oxygen in there. Right. It was all carbon, I mean, uh, what do you call that? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, yes, indeed. And so he's gaily wrenching the uh, fittings on top of these things, and Dale says, I came to work about 3.30, and I noticed the cobalt door was open. I walked down there and opened the door. Hare is just laid out on top of the cakes with this big grin on his face, rapture of the deep, uh -huh. nitrogen narcosis, <laughs> above ground, above sea level. So he drug him out of there. They got him revived, and he was just fine. He did much worse to things to himself, probably voluntarily. Well, not at work. No, usually not. <laughs> we did. It was a point of honor that we learned to do everything we knew how to do there on, in every condition known to mankind, so that regardless of what might befall us, we could continue to put on shows regardless. And this worked so well that during a uh, hot tuna show, somebody passed a full bottle of tequila with several dozen hits of LSD in it into the back stage. And of course, see a bottle of tequila coming, everybody take a bite and pass it along. And the moon was full and Pretty soon I started feeling funny and I realized what was happening. I had been a TRIPS counselor and then I noticed that other people were starting to feel funny too. So this, before the show was even over, we called up to Brackenridge and told them that if people came wandering in there from Armadillo acting funny, that this is what had happened. And it seemed to be pretty clean. It was probably going to be all right. Just give them some orange juice and take them outside on that nice hillside by the emergency room. They could watch the moon and play guitars. And we'd be by as soon as we got the money counted and the joint closed down to take care of the rest of them. And it was a very ple pleasant evening. And having warned them that way, they were able to kind of very, very politely gently. and gently host people down to the hillside. And by the time I got there, there was probably 150 people scattered around that hillside. Spent the night there on Red River Street, and it was, it was very pleasant. It was very nice. And uh, whoever thought they were going to get us only just made it a little more interesting. Seems like 150 is a lot for one bottle of tequila. There might have been more than one source of that. Well, there could have been, Jeez. but the, the fact was there was a lot inside that bottle. Uh -huh. There was a lot. A little goes a long way. Yes, yes, indeed. And you figure assorted smoochings, this, that, and the other thing. Of course, nobody ever shared hand-rolled cigarettes in those days, so that couldn't have been it. So, got a little carried away there. So that was, that was just one night at the Armadillo World Headquarters. Well, that's right. Actually, that was... Hey, look at that. Have we already done a half an hour? We've done half an hour. and uh, No, we've not done half an hour yet, but we will do half an hour. And before we, uh, before we do the second half of the show, we'll, uh, we'll take this break for this one little bit of uh, uh, insanity, and we'll be right back to uh, finish the interview with young Michael Priest. All right, now let me... Let, let me... Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay. Cackling off let me... Uh, now let me introduce you to one of Austin's oldest residents. This is, this live oak back here is at 2605 South Lamar. It's the um, 
It's the old hanging tree. It's the fourth largest tree in South Austin. It's 16 feet, 10 inches around when measured four and a half feet up from the ground. It's the old hanging tree. This used to be the site, this is the site of El Rancho now. This used to be the site of the famous hanging tree bar. One of Austin's oldest and largest residents, the hanging tree of South Lamar. It used to be the old San Antonio Highway. Hanging tree on the old San Antonio Highway. No, this was the old Fredericksburg Highway. Fredericksburg Congress Highway. was the old San Antonio Highway. Fredericksburg Highway, so you go. Voiceovers. <laughs> okay. All right, we're back now here on the South Austin Show with the interview for Michael Priest. Now, Michael, it's uh, uh, one thing we're wondering since, this, uh, uh, since the first of the show, since my first question, uh, uh, is, is, is how you got involved with the um, uh, poster business at Armadillo World Headquarters. <laughs> And I was wondering if you could uh, 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 share a little details of that. Now, of course, when it, when it opened, what, what did, did Jim Franklin do all the uh, posters? Well, he didn't do all of them, but he certainly did most of them, and he named the place, and he pretty much arrived at the armadillo as a uh, symbol of Austin's underground. Uh, Whitehead, Glenn Whitehead, had drawn the first uh, armadillo comics that we know of in the Ranger, and they were just little single-shot one-line things that were really hilarious and Franklin started doing comic strips three and four frame comic strips uh, because he like most people had never seen an armadillo that wasn't squashed beside the road flat and so he began to fantasize when he talked to people and no they hadn't seen one alive either he began to make up what their life was like and uh, uh, he would draw that and that caught on pretty good, and Armadillo World Headquarters started, and it was the perfect name for the joint, because by then there was armadillos everywhere. And how I got into it actually was, I was art directing an ad agency when I was 20 years old, involved in youth marketing, which was a lucky thing. The oldest guy in the company was 24. Mm. And uh, it was Joe Gracie and myself and Mike Osborne and John Harms. And John had been a bartender at Armadillo, and uh, I think Ed had just spent all the money in the world on a John Sebastian show, including a four-color, hand-separated poster by Danny Garrett that he didn't pay nearly enough for, but still it was way too expensive, and they paid the band thousands of dollars. Right. Uh, John Sebastian, his guitar player, and their wives, and nobody came. And... Uh, he decided it might be, Eddie decided it might be a good idea to hire our company to help him promote their shows. And so uh, after I did a lot of ads for the beer garden and helped build the beer garden so that we'd have a place to go when you got off your construction job that you could just walk right in and get a cold beer without having to go home, get a shower, change clothes, fall asleep before you, you know, you could drink while you were thirsty. Yeah. And it was outdoors and it was nice and there was shade and a little bit of a breeze being in South Austin, relatively quiet. And uh, it really kind of gave a place for South Austinites to be South Austinites, to be as laid back as they actually were. Sometimes they tried to act like people from other places for short periods of time, but this was a place that was kind of just for us. Everybody was welcome, of course, but there was no pretense involved. It was South a real laid was in, back was in the place. process of becoming itself, what, it, what, what yeah. it was going to be. Yeah, and to a great extent it was already like that, but nobody knew if it was okay or not. You know, Texas, in fact, at that point, was not particularly sure if it was okay to be Texans again. Oh, it, 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 there was a lot of people that were very sure about what they wanted in, in Texas back in the early 70s and late 60s. Uh, I remember uh, the Dodge City Steakhouse up on North Lamar had a big bathtub <laughs> on, a, on, a sta on, on a pole right in front of the... If, if any hippie decides to come into their place, he's going to get washed. That's in, right. In, in that they said reserved for hippies. Reserved for hippies. And but, as late as 1974, we walked into Jake's on 5th Street, and my hair probably wasn't as long as it is now. And there was four of us. In fact, I think it was the guys from Directions Company. And the fella come around the end of the counter as soon as we walked in the door. Shorty. Waving his towel at us going, gentlemen, it's good to see you and I'll be glad to serve you after you get a haircut. And just shoot us right on out of the business. Only place I ever got kicked out of for having a long hair. Excellent. Jake's. Well, it's Jerry not, Jacobs not... Barbecue Systems down on, uh, down on, uh, Barton Springs would allow long hair. Where Shady Grove is now. Shady Grove 
which was called Shady Grove then, that had the big movie screen that gave you messages about Jesus in between adverts for their uh, barbecue, they would not allow long hairs in there. But Jerry J Jones, Jerry Jacobs. Jerry Jacobs pit barbecue system. You'd walk in the door and he'd go, always glad to see you people. <laughs> so like Ross Perot at the uh, NAACP. <laughs> exactly right. Come on down. Always happy to serve you people. So uh, we didn't realize how much like aliens we looked to everybody else, but we didn't much care. So these posters you were talking about. <laughs> well, I started drawing some. My first one, of course, I was in awe of Jim Franklin and Danny Garrett and, and uh, uh, Gilbert Shelton, the fellows that had been doing Austin poster art carry on. And at the time I arrived in town, Franklin was gone to Tulsa and actually points beyond to Disney, Oklahoma, to paint Leon Russell's swimming pool. And uh, carry on and Rick Turner and Tom Bauman uh, were three other regular Austin poster artists. They were all gone to San Francisco to the Ripoff Press to try and get a uh, publisher to get Ripoff Press to publish their comic book called Neighborhead Comics. Neighborhead. Now these are the fellows that did uh, the Freak Brothers, a lot of which if you read Freak Brothers comics it's pretty hard to tell if they're talking about San Francisco or Austin and it turned out it was all mixed up. But the Ripoff, Ripoff Press told these guys their stuff was too local and it didn't have enough universal appeal and that they weren't good and it was too weird now the ripoff press the first totally uncensored publishing company right. in the united states yeah. turned these guys down sent them home zap, zap told them their stuff was too weird so in their absence i was doing posters for mother earth and for castle creek and for pretty much every other live music joint in town because i just arrived on the scene and uh, i had a organization that was going out there and beating the streets. Trial by fire. Exactly right. And uh, uh, Ed decided after the John Sebastian whipping to hire us. And uh, through the course of that first summer, I worked there in 1972. I took turns of being a bouncer as well. He uh, developed a relationship with Willie Nelson and decided it would be a good idea to introduce Willie Nelson to the long-haired weirdos down in Austin. And me and five other hippies sat in a circle with Will up on 34th and Grooms one evening and talked him into coming down here. He had been down in like 64 or 65 to play the Broken Spoke, uh -huh. but he had never thought about playing the long-haired weirdos. And uh, he seemed to like the idea just fine. It didn't might take much convincing. But that was my first poster for Armadillo, and I'm afraid that promotion worked a little better than anybody had any right to to expect. Well, you did the Cosmic Cowboy poster. I had done a few. I had done this drawing back when Steve Miller came out with the song Cosmic Cowboy some years before that sat around in my sketchbook for a long time. And by the time we actually used it for something, which I believe was the benefit for KPFT down in Houston, the listener-sponsored Pacifica station down there. We thought it was the goodbye to the Cosmic Cowboy. 1973, we was all tired of it and uh, thought it was all over and it was supposed to be the so longs and had 10 or 12 Austin bands and fixing to be Austin bands that became famous in your progressive country outlaw cosmic so forth. I thought of it more as permissive country, but yeah. The, yes. It was it. I liked how Juke wrote it on his uh, Doak Sneed poster. It said, Caressive Country. There we are. That's what, what, what I like that one better. Well, that, so, was a, that was, a, that was a, what, it was, it was 74 when uh, Carry On drew the uh, Groover's Paradise cover. True. Cover for uh, Doug Somm, which yep. just sort of... Had some more of it. it. It stuck on us. It was like whacking the tar baby. But, uh... uh <laughs> Sorry. No, that's right. Uh, them posters. Oh, the other thing was, was at, as a 20-year-old art director, I was suddenly faced with directing all these armadillo artists. As the, I finally went up and got Jim Franklin and brought him back, although we, he wasn't finished. But I was able to help him a little bit. And I was able to hire uh, Ken Featherston and uh, Guy Juke, Sam Yates, uh, just about anybody that came through town that could draw with a pen and ink 
we ended up hiring. Uh, got all the fellas back from when they came back from San Francisco. We got all those guys in on it. And uh, we were, Armadillo was getting beginning to be booked every day because they had the beer garden now where they could be open when they didn't have the hall. And uh, there was a, and beginning to get lots of road shows and there was just a huge wealth of posters to be drawn. It was the only way to promote the shows. The radio stations didn't really cover it. The, t the Statesman certainly didn't cover anything. The Texan to some extent, we'd buy a little ad in the Texan, but really the way to get the word out, the way Armadillo got started and the way Vulcan promoted their shows was Jim Franklin would draw these wild ass posters and hippies would stand right where the university emptied out on the Guadalupe there in front of the co-op right. and pass those posters out. And you could read them right there, but generally we tried to make them interesting enough that you'd want to take them with you and stick them up on the wall. And uh, we began to hire people to stick them up on walls around town, and people would come right behind them, tearing them down. So they took to putting up six or seven or eight in a row, figuring that, well, maybe one or two will last. We'd do that as soon as the posters came out, and then a couple of days before the show, we'd do it again. Hit again. Yeah. I think Featherston did a Franklin, and then Juke did a Featherston. In their st changing yeah, styles? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Featherston did a poster in Franklin style. Juke did one in Featherston style. We started doing each other's styles. We didn't really notice while we were doing it. And uh, this, I think it was a Sleep at the Wheel poster came out that everybody thought the other guy had done. And it turned out it wasn't any of us. It was this new guy, Sam Yates, who had come into town and went, oh, you guys have a homogenous ink style. I can do that too. There you go. <laughs> and we didn't realize that. Everybody, of course, was horrified. And so the st everybody kind of exploded into radically different styles. Juke began to do Cubist Bebop, and Danny Garrett did the real fine classic stuff with the really carefully rendered surfaces. And I did more cartoony stuff. And Carrie's style was always way out there cartoony. I think. Uh uh, pretty much to a man to live in South Austin uh, where uh, we celebrate and we've been celebrating and we will continue to celebrate same time same channel uh, and I uh, hope you guys tune in